Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Science Under the Dome. My name is Jeremy Osowski with Fisk Planetarium. With me, we have our uh, series, uh, what would you call it, Proctor, our series uh, navigator, Jimmy. Facilitator. Facilitator, there we go. Uh, take it away for us, Jimmy. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. So my name is Jimmy Negus. I'm a fourth year graduate student studying astronomy at CU Boulder. I'm also one of the lead facilitators for our Science Under the Dome series. Thank you all for tuning in again. Uh, as a reminder, we will continue providing high quality videos until Fisk Planetarium reopens. And of course, throughout the talk, please be sure to drop any questions you have for our speaker and we will address them at the end. You're in for a real treat tonight. Today's talk is gonna be featured under our Science and Society series. It will be given by Prosh. Prosh is currently pursuing his PhD with the Network Systems Group at the Department of Computer Science at CU Boulder. His research explores the use of formal methods and AI to improve the performance of existing communication and computing systems architectures. His primary research interest focuses on the verification and testing of communication protocols. Prosh holds a master's in electrical engineering from CU Boulder and from the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. He aspires to contribute to the work of building smart infrastructure systems while trying to limit the possible harms that the technologies pose to social justice. His research proposal, proposal in this domain titled Future of the Autonomous Self was selected as one of the top 100 ideas in the NSF's 2026 Idea Challenge. In this talk, we shall explore the consequences of modern day social media and socio-technical platforms in shaping our sense of what it means to be an autonomous agent. We consider our changing norms around the idea of living an authentic life in the midst of social oppression and techno-political change. We first explore some of the theoretical ideas of personal autonomy, which shall be followed by the ways in which social oppression impacts an individual's sense of autonomy. And finally, we try to examine our collective responsibility in protecting the ideals of personal autonomy within a democratic nation. With that, Prash, please take it away. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for taking this time to talk. Um, so I was wondering, should I be sharing this screen right now? Okay. Is this visible? Uh, okay, so I'd like to start by expressing my gratitude to the organizers of Science and Society talk series at FISC for giving me this opportunity to talk about something I care about. And to all the members at FISC who have helped me in the process of refining this talk, any blemishes that you might perceive is solely my responsibility. I would like you all, my audience, to note that I am trained in the engineering and the sciences. I'm a dilettante in the fields of history, sociology, and psychology. I prepared this talk to share some of the lessons I have learned and the connections that I've made while on my personal journey to understand the ways in which technology impacts personal autonomy. And obviously, there's a lot more to the knowledge out there that I might not have explored. I might get to share only a tip of the iceberg with you all. I would like to consider this talk as an opportunity for me to share some of the questions that I'm concerned about and to create a space where we can explore these themes together by asking questions and discussing our varied perspectives on this important but less addressed topic that impacts all of us today. This talk shall be split into the following five sections. We start with an introduction, then proceed into an inquiry in, into autonomy, followed by a discussion of the existing systems of oppression. Then we try to bring all the themes together and determine how they are connected with technology. And finally, we shall try to explore how this guides us in our thinking about the future of the autonomous self. So let's begin. What makes you, you and not me? To help guide all the threads that might be running in your mind now, let's try to consider some simple questions. When was the last time that you purchased something after seeing an advertisement on your phone? When was the last time that you bought something after someone told you about it? When was the last time that you left swipe someone on a dating app who looked different from you? 
or when was the last time that you refused to go for a talk because you realize that the people who are talking aren't your people let's take a few seconds um to ponder over some of these questions um do you think these questions should be relevant to a talk about personal autonomy now let's sit back and watch this video about spot a resident at boston dynamics The science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke once said that any sufficient any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Having primed you sufficiently for the next task, I would like to ask what comes to your mind when we talk about intelligence. Hmm? We might be primed to think about all the business buzzwords that you hear today: artificial intelligence, general AI, explainable AI, and all of that. might be perceived to be embodied in these robotic specimens like spot that you saw earlier and atlas from boston dynamics that we have here we might even make the mistake of looking at what our infant or child at home does and says and say that they are going to grow up to be as smart as a computer or a robot it might do us well to remember that a computer was once a profession it was a career choice made by some highly skilled women who were trained as mathematicians and were do, were good at computing they served as the cheap labor force of corporations and the government during the period of the world wars the machines that were built to replace the competent humans who performed those tasks were called computers these computers were supposed to be good imitators or mimic artists of the human workers and today we observe an interesting cultural phenomenon the computer has become the embodiment of the highest form of intelligence um from the period when we dreamt of building machines as smart as humans today we talk about children being as intelligent as a computer what we have is a phenomena where the cultural semantics or meaning of intelligence has changed do you think this change in meaning of a word of the word intelligence can have any serious consequences to society I request you to hold on to this thought while I proceed to something that's related. What comes to your mind when you think about autonomous being? These are some of the examples that come to my mind. We have some examples of autonomous robots that shall be used for delivering food, for delivering packages, and some field robots that can help us in agriculture or underwater surveys. Right? These devices are being marketed to us by calling them autonomous. the question i have for us is the following do we have reason to believe that we are in the process of changing what we mean by being autonomous just as we observed a, a change in meaning in the word intelligence are we in the process of repeating this cultural shift for the word autonomy and more importantly does this have any social and political implications in our society let's begin our exploration into this line of inquiry we start with this illustration of the human as an entity that represents some set of capabilities that we roughly describe as intelligence and autonomy are we the only ones with these capabilities probably not we have liked to believe that these are attributes of life and living beings just as humans the homo sapiens is one type of life form it's possible that human intelligence and human autonomy are just manifestations of a larger concept of intelligence and autonomy in life the folks here at fisk would like to believe that we don't need to focus on life on earth alone 
we can look far out into space and determine the possibility of life in other planets and star systems apart from the solar system. They could be non-carbon life forms. However, we shall try to restrict ourselves to considering the few carbon-based life forms like the octopus, horses, dolphins, squids, and chimpanzees as fellow intelligent and autonomous beings. While we think about autonomy in the animal kingdom, we might think that animals can be differentiated into two groups, the tamed, the domesticated beings, which are few, and the wild beings who cannot be domesticated. On that note, is it possible to consider the human species to have constituted of the wild humans, maybe the Neanderthals or the Homo erectus, are all specimens of humans who were possibly driven to extinction by us Homo sapiens, the manifestation of the civilized man or the tamed humans. However, maybe when we think about autonomy, what we consider isn't just a question of being wild and tamed, but rather to identify the category of civilized man itself, which is split into the autonomous person and the enslaved puppet. Thus, what we would like to do is to truly pursue a line of inquiry where we understand intelligence and autonomy in life by trying to understand what contributes to the making of an autonomous person. Can we develop a model of different capabilities that are required to realize an autonomous person? Autonomy as a word has its origins in the Greek words autos and nomos, referring to self-law or an entity that is governed by its own laws. It is used in various contexts like politics, where we talk about the autonomy of a nation state. In business, where we refer to the autonomy of a business entity. However, we shall focus on the notion of personal autonomy as it pertains to a person. The inquiry into personal autonomy has been pursued by different academic communities over the ages. There are two different ways in which we have, or they have proceeded. On the left, we observe that the pursuit to understand the expansive concept of intelligence and autonomy in life within the arts, humanities, and the sciences. On the right, we observe a much more recent direction of inquiry. As developed over the last 100 years, where we have tried to design, engineer, and build a machine that imitates, or let's say mimics, the human notion of intelligence and autonomy. This direction of inquiry roughly parallels the common adage, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, then it's possibly a duck. More seriously, we believe that if we can build a machine that seems to be intelligent and autonomous, then we have possibly learned something about the larger concept of intelligence and autonomy by creating it or birthing it within an artificial device. If we were to proceed to inquire into autonomy, what would we need, right? We would possibly need as an input to our process of inquiry an autonomous being. And then we would generate or extract knowledge out of this process. The animal psychologists and philosophers have often tried uh, to consider a healthy autonomous being as their input to gain knowledge and about autonomy. The cognitive neuroscientist, however, tries to study individuals with compromised autonomy to determine the factors that contributed to their difference in behaviors. Let's try to understand some of the things that their explorations have revealed to us. We begin with um, uh, we, to begin, we need to identify the difference between the notions of a person and a self. This illustration helps us realize that the self is a personal notion, as it describes the relationship of an entity with itself. The person, however, refers to a relationship between an entity and another entity. Hence, it is a social notion. We can consider a self to have a mind, right? A mind with two parts, the the conscious part, which we are aware of, and the unconscious, which we are not aware of, and we might not even know how it compares uh, in size to the conscious mind. The conscious mind can be assumed to be composed of a notion of a self and personal identity. Um, I understand that these are all broad terms, but it might take uh, a, a lot of time to explore each area in depth. On the notion of personal identity, we can consider that a person is not reducible to either the concept of mind or body, but they exist in an environment as an active agent who has feelings and attitudes and takes actions on the world and on other persons, right? So the personal identity can be said to be composed of bodily identity, agential identity, and narrative identity. Let's watch this video to understand the narrative identity a little better.
Seven years ago, Joe had brain surgery to allay the effects of severe epilepsy. His surgeon cut the nerve fibers connecting his left hemisphere with his right. While the operation was a complete success, Joe's unusual case offers an extraordinary insight into the machinery of mind. This fiber system, the corpus callosum, is located midway between the two hemispheres. When it was surgically severed in Joe's brain, the transmission of information between the two hemispheres was halted. Michael Gazanica. What we can do is play tricks by putting information into his di disconnected, mute, non-talking right hemisphere and watch it produce behaviors. And out of that, we can really see that there is, in fact, uh, a reason to believe that there's all kinds of complex processes going on outside of his conscious awareness of his left half brain. Joe, I'm going to show you some things. I just want you to tell me what you see. And here we go. You ready? Look right at the dot. Okay. Right. Okay, you ready? Look right at the dot. Great. Good. When Joe focuses on a point, everything to the right of the point goes to his left brain, the dominant hemisphere for language and speech. So we can see here that when we flash a word or a picture, Joe is easily able to name it. See it. Close your eyes and let your left hand do a little work here. Okay, what do you got there? Pen. Okay, very good. Now, when a word or a picture falls to the left of a fixation point, that information goes to his disconnected right half brain. And as we can see here, Joe is unable to name it. Joe is able to draw the picture with his left hand, the left hand getting its major control from the right half brain. As uh, the map of the mind that we have up to now is as follows. As Dr. Michael Gazanigal later says, the, neuro the neurological case history presented by Joe teaches us that the mind is made up of a constellation of, of semi-independent agents or processes that can carry out vast amounts of computational activity that is outside our consciousness. He later points out that there is a system in the left hemisphere, which is called the interpreter system, that pulls all of this information together into a theory, a coherent narrative to explain all these independent elements. It is this system that helps us develop a theory of ourselves and the world. We often make the mistake of assuming that humans are rational beings. The discovery of the interpreter system in the left hemisphere of the human brain helped us realize that we are just rationalizing beings, or in simple words, we are just very good liars to ourselves first and to others later. How does this concept of ourself help us understand autonomy? To determine this, we move ahead to consider the work of Harry Frankfurt and Gerald Dworkin during the late 70s and 80s, uh, where they propose the hierarchical model of personal autonomy. They describe a person as an intentional system with the capacity for self-consciousness. When we observe an action of a person and we ask ourselves, why did this person do this? What motivated her to do it? The motivations of a person that gets converted into an action are called the first order desires. An action here is considered in the broader sense of any physical action, speech, silence, or even inaction. However, when the object of our desire is not an action, but a desire itself, then these motivations are called second order desires. For example, I may desire to go for a run early tomorrow morning and I do and would do so. That's an expression of my first order desire. That is an expression of my will. However, if I am a person who likes to be lazy and not do any exercise, and I desire that I become a person who wakes up early every day and prepares for a marathon. Now, this is an expression of my second order desire. That is my freedom to will. I desire to become someone who desires to wake up early every day and run. Gerald Dworkin extended the hierarchical model of volitions to the hierarchical model of the personal autonomy by saying, that there are two aspects to consider when we think about the statement, government of the person by himself. When we talk about himself, we are considering this concept of self-identification. When we talk about government, we are considering the concept of self-evaluation. Now, when the person is capable of both the self-evaluation and self-identification, that is when we say that a person is being authentic. 
However, it is not enough to be authentic, to be autonomous. Why? One needs to be autonomous. One needs to be authentic while also ensuring that the processes of self-identification and self-evaluation were procedurally independent. Thus, to summarize the model, we started with the hierarchical model of volitions, describing the hierarchy of desires which result in action. This hierarchy is assumed to be limited to two levels by the notion of the primitive identifications or the value system of a person. This value system drives us to care about something deeply. We identify ourselves and our entire being with these desires, right? And this value system then guides our capacity for self-evaluation and self-identification. And thus, we obtain the proposed hierarchical model of personal autonomy. We can now expand our earlier map of the mind with the self-identity composed of agential narrative and the bodily uh, identity by adding a component for self-evaluation and then another component for the value system. We need to note that it is through the value system which matures over the course of psychological development of an infant into an adult that the external world impacts a person's autonomy. The two ways in which our values are impacted are by the values we imbibe from within our families and from the larger social context that we inhabit. With the above discussion, we have completed what it means to build a model and gain knowledge by, uh, by studying a given autonomous being. We can now proceed to exploring the other direction as pursued by computer scientists of using the knowledge of the model that we have um, and building an autonomous robot um, that has the features that we want. In his book, The Emotion Machine, Professor Marvin Minsky says that he disagrees with the concepts of emotion, thought, consciousness, unconsciousness, and all the words that have been used previously in literature. One can think of these as blanket words. These are words that label, but do not explain. He likes to consider a person as composed of finite set of resources spread throughout the mind and the body. Each emotion or cognitive process may be characterized by the particular subset of um, resources that are activated at a certain time. It's possible that there are not just one type of resources, but possibly a hierarchy of the types of resources. In this simple model, what we have here is two, uh, two different types of resources, right? Uh, when a certain subset of resources are activated, which correspond to the emotion of, uh, or the feeling of being threatened, the high level resource called critic uh, identifies this emotion and then alerts the high level resource called selector to then determine what should be the response of this agent. The selector activates a certain subset of resources which either correspond to fight or to flee, and then the person behaves correspondingly. There's a much more detailed model that Professor Minsky presents in his book, but for the purposes of our talk, all we need to remember is that each of the computational capabilities that we have requires a finite set of resources within the being. And as the resources are consumed, energy is consumed within the person. With that, we have tried to cover an inquiry into autonomy with a focus on the human individual and the machine. We can say that we have adopted two different hats when thinking about this question. When we wear the hat of a designer or the developer, we ask the following questions. How can we create an auto autonomous being and which architectures and models help us realize a specific cognitive ability? When we wear the hat of a tester or tinker, tinkerer, we ask the following questions. How can the autonomy of an individual be compromised? What do we learn by compromising different mental faculties? Let's take the perspective of a tester and ask how to tame not a dragon, but a human. Well, the most obvious way is through the human body, right? Through the person's body, through biological mutation, physiological manipulation, and chemical intoxication. The other more challenging way uh, is through the person's mind. The two methods that are commonly used are psychological manipulation, abuse, uh, maybe it could be violence, physical or emotional abuse, and trauma. One other way in which a person is stained through the control of their mind is not often talked about in this manner. It is through what we refer to as established systems of oppression within the society. The systems of oppression can be understood by reviewing their domains of organization. Within the social realm, we have gender, caste, and race. Within the economic realm, we can talk about class. And finally, in the political realm, we have the citizens and the slaves the stateless and the refugees. Now separating out different domains of analysis helps us in analyzing the dynamics of oppression within each category clearly. However, to truly understand the complexity of the phenomena they describe, we need to examine the systems that lie at the intersection of all of these domains. 
namely the larger systems of logic within which these domains of power and control are exercised. From a historical lens, the three most important systems at the intersection are the feudalistic imperialism, capitalistic imperialism, and surveillance capitalism. What is interesting for me is to note that each successive system led to an economic, um, sorry. So here what we have is um, a representation of the different systems um, on a historical timeline. About around 500 or 5,000 years ago with the movement of a group of humans from mainland Europe to um, other lands across the world, we had the origins of the new system of capitalistic imperialism. And finally, around 20 years ago, with the spread of the internet um, and the developments in communication and computing technologies, we entered into the age of surveillance capitalism. What is interesting for me is to note that each successive system led to an accompanying development of a new social hierarchy or characterization of people. The systems of oppression called caste and gender were created during the time of feudalistic imperialism around 5,000 years ago. With the advent of the capitalistic imperialism, we had the formation of race and class. Um, and we are currently in the process of creating new social orders possibly within the context of this surveillance capitalistic system of production and consumption. So please hold on to this thought for a bit as we try uh, to get back to this in a bit. We have thus glimpsed a historical trajectory of development of various systems of oppression. One may suitably ask, how do these systems of oppression impact personal autonomy? We saw earlier that the only way for the external world to impact a person's autonomy is through impacting their value system. Earlier, we were trying to understand the autonomy as if it was a property of an individual. So the question is, if I am alone on an island and there's no one else around, then can I consider myself to be autonomous? Now the community view of personal autonomy says that you cannot, why? Because our capacity to constitute meaning and rule following depends on a social context. It is only within a social context can I exercise my freedom of the will to either conform or to deviate from the social norms. So now, Let's consider what it means for a person to live within a social context. I've represented here a simple caricature for the different cognitive tasks that one is involved in within a social context. Now, this is me, the person in yellow. This is my perception of myself. If there's some other in green, this image represents my mental model of what the other person thinks about me. And finally, there's me thinking about how I perceive myself to be. Each of these cognitive tasks are resource intensive. Uh, the social oppressive systems impact a person's autonomy by forcing them to activate these cognitive tasks that are engaged to handle the demands placed on them by the social context. By activating each of these cognitive processes, we have different experiences of the self. In this slide, we can represent the mind to be made up of the following different experiences of the self. First, there's the experience of oneself in the first person, then there's a self's perception of oneself with, in a third person, person perspective. And finally, there's the imagined self as perceived by some other. We might have only one or more of these experiences of ourselves in any given context. Remember that the more processes that are running, the more resources are being used and the more energy that is being used. Now, I'd like to explain this with uh, a personal narrative about a racialized conception of myself. When I reached Bolo, it was after a year that I realized that I am a brown person. In the eyes of the people around me, I'm not Prashant first. I'm just another brown person. So I needed to inform myself first of the fears, the prejudices, and the biases that's associated with a brown man in this country or this context. Now, there are filters through which they, a stranger who sees me passes me through before they get to know me. Now, if it's a stranger who is from a different country, they might first determine that, oh, what is this person's race? He seems to be brown. What is this person's ethnicity? He might be somewhere from South Asia. But if it is someone who's from the subcontinent uh, that I meet as a stranger, they might be wondering, what is this person's nationality? Does he come from India? Does he come from Nepal? Does he come from Pakistan? If the stranger is, uh, they might also think about what is this person's religion or caste? So what I would like to say here is that we, when we interact with strangers, we essentially have to pass through many layers of filters before they finally get to see me. And then they see me as a person, as Prashant. Um, and with this, I would like to lead you to the point of how does the social systems that we have 
uh, contribute or impact the sense of personal autonomy. Any system of social oppression leads to the formation of oppressive stereotypes and social scripts that dictate the role of the person and the responsibilities, and also the valuation of persons differently based on the roles that they play. The, these impacts, um, these social systems impact a person by deforming their desires, by defining the way they relate to themselves and the way they relate to others around them. So the primary concern we have around oppressive social scripts and stereotypes is that it impacts a person's sense of belonging, loneliness, isolation, marginalization, and victimizations that follow from race, caste, gender-based profiling disrupts the social basis of a person's self-esteem. Now, why is this important? If I do not have self-esteem, or if, if I feel that I do not have a social place, then I cannot take ownership of my choices and my actions. And um, so we would normally assume um, that if I desire an ice cream, and then I try to get it, then I'm being autonomous. But what if your desire for an ice cream was not your own? You were made to have that desire. And that's what we mean by a deformed desire. So think about marketing and advertising. Uh, advertising. These are tools that the industry uses to manipulate our desires. So we know that the systems of oppression have a way to deform our desires. And how do these deformed desires manifest themselves in our daily life? For one, we call them adaptive preferences. So who you choose as a partner on a dating app, when you left swipe or right, right swipe someone, you're exercising your adaptive preference. Uh, the practice of endogamy, like marriage within one's own race and caste, that is an, a form of adaptive preference. The other way in which it manifests itself is double consciousness. You know, the awareness of the stereotype that the other person uses to evaluate me makes me completely conscious of the other person's thought process within me all the time. And I need to respond to that script, even if I do not believe in it. There's also the, the aspect of the double bind. So let's assume that I belong to a subordinated identity and I intend to pursue poetry. Should I go ahead and learn poetry? Shouldn't I be fighting for the rights of my people? And how do I choose between the two? Right? These are the ways in which um, the social oppressive systems impact the autonomy of a person by modifying or deforming their desires. So, Let's get back and try to figure out how this fits in together with all that we have covered earlier. What we have explored till now, we have charted out the ways in which the systems of oppression impacts personal autonomy by developing the following. A mental model of the different mental faculties that constitute an autonomous person, the external factors that impact the value system of an individual, and the social context that shapes the family and the value system and defines the arena within which the person relates to themselves and to others. Then we identified the systems of oppression impacts personal autonomy by deforming the desires of the individual. Additionally, the cognitive processes that govern our experiences of the self is modified or impacted by the systems of oppression through the social scripts and the double consciousness. The social scripts that are internalized impacts a person's self-perception and the social stereotypes forces a person to constantly inhabit a state of double consciousness by being very aware of other people's perceptions of themselves. So we have examined how the systems of oppression impacts personal autonomy. Next, we need to proceed to examine how the systems of oppression influence technology. The idealistic view that we all like to believe in is the following. Science is an input to engineering and technology research, which then leads to the design and deployment of technology. I present policy and law as layers of a stack that influence the context within which, of within which the technology is deployed and developed. However, sadly, this isn't the complete picture. The social context comprising of the social norms, the values, the ideology, and the systems of oppression also serve as social inputs into the engineering technology research by shaping its research questions, and also by determining the people who get engaged in this process. Additionally, the systems of oppression also serve as inputs into the process of policy making and the formulation and enforcement of law. To illustrate this phenomena with an example, we can consider the ways in which the democratic ideal of meritocracy reproduces historical inequality. In her book, The Cast of Merit, Professor Ajanta Subramanian presents a historical anthropology of technical education in India. At the heart of her study is a set of highly coveted engineering colleges called the Indian Institutes of Technology that are equally representative of Indian meritocracy and until recently of caste exclusivity. 
The politics of meritocracy at the IITs illuminates the social life of caste in contemporary India, where we witness the re-articulation of caste as an explicit basis of merit and the generation of newly consolidated forms of upper casteness. Additionally, in his book, The Meritocracy Trap, the author Daniel Markowitz examines how America's foundational myth of meritocracy feeds inequality, stifles social mobility, and makes everyone, including the apparent winners, miserable. He says, quote, one of the essential features of the sort of meritocracy we have today is intensive competition. The kind of system that I want is one where social and economic life advantages are given to people who are good enough at the thing they're doing to be socially useful, end quote. Thus, what we witness is a process of co-production of technology and the systems of oppression. I quote Professor Ruha Benjamin's words, race is a social construct and race constructs. Similarly, all systems of oppression are social constructs and they construct too. They are productive systems as there, is, as there is someone who benefits from the system while some others who suffer and are abused by, within the system. Race and technology co-produce each other, caste and technology co-produces each other, gender and technology co-produces each other. So he, we have seen earlier that the systems of oppression impacts personal autonomy. We've also noted that the systems of oppression and technology co-produces each other. Now it is my thesis that the systems of oppression and technology co-produce each other by impacting the personal autonomy of the individuals engaged in this system of production and consumption. We often think that technology um, is good or bad or that a technology directly causes harm to the person, but that's not true. We need to understand that the technology does not operate on its own. Um, sorry. It is the complexity of the relationship between technology, the systems of oppression, and the personal autonomy of individuals who are involved in the interaction that guides the outcome we observe of good or bad. Let us now proceed to examine this nexus between technology and the systems of oppression and personal autonomy. Um, any system of oppression can be suitably, so I saw, I'm sorry for this, uh, yeah. Any system of oppression can be suitably analyzed through the framework of the four eyes of oppression which refers to using either of the following lens, the ideological lens, the institutional lens, or the interpersonal lens, and the internal lens. When examining the systems of oppression like racism or casteism, we can reflect on the interpersonal and the internal by considering the example of online dating services. There's plenty of research that shows that people right and left swipe faces of people based on their implicit biases and the racial stereotypes. If you're using a service like Tinder, where you have make judgments about people based on the photographs they have posted, then it's highly likely that you're letting your implicit biases guide you in your dating process. Let's consider the problem of social media influencers. There was a time when the communication application and social media platforms were used primarily for the purpose of messaging. However, now it's possible for me to use these platforms to commercialize my relationship with any person. I can market or advertise any good from a company and based on my viewership, I shall be paid a fee by the company. Now, this practice of seeking financial gain through people's social engagement with others has led to a general decline in trust of the authenticity of individuals. Now, during the pandemic, uh, the practice of social distancing has also led to the problem of social isolation. The social media platforms and digital media have become the primary ways of which people can socialize and engage within a community. Now, social norms around the use of various apps have led folks to develop and present different aspects of their identities on different applications. We often ask whether a particular technology is good or bad. The answer is it depends, in particular on the wider context uh, that animates the birthing and dissemination of a technology. To examine the nexus of technology and society through the ideological and institutional lens, it will help us to represent the society as fragmented into two groups. On the left, we have the haves uh, or the dominant groups. And on the right, we have the subaltern society, the have-nots or the subordinated groups. We present technology at the center with arrowheads pointed in either direction to depict who uses the technology and whom it targets. To start off, let's consider the problem of inaccessible architecture and design. In the documentary, Crip Camp, we learned that from the early 70s onwards, there were individuals who began campaigning um, uh, against discrimination in education, medical health facilities, and the workspaces based on whether or not they were able-bodied. In this context, the mainstream society comprising of able-bodied individuals who were the primary designers of the buildings, roads, and infrastructure, which was used by all, including the individuals with disabilities. 
The product of their designs were inconsiderate of the needs of those with disabilities, and hence the architectures and designs that got deployed were inaccessible in nature. The oppressed group of people with disabilities had to campaign to get their policies and laws changed to finally establish the regulations that ensured the development of spaces that were conducive for their active engagement in society as equal citizens of the state. Over the last few years, we have come to realize that the design decisions around digital technology are inherently political. Why? Because they have real world consequences on human lives. For example, when we consider the technologies for surveillance, like body cameras, surveillance cameras outside homes and buildings and contact tracing during pandemics. Right? The dominant groups perceive surveillance as a luxury service, something which they favor, something which they may opt out of if they so desire. However, the subordinated groups feel that they have been enforced into a system of surveillance. The, the surveillance machinery, machinery is driven by the landlords, by the workplaces, um, which conduct surveillance on their behaviors and engagements without them having a say on whether they consent to it or not. The 2020 Internet Health Report published by Mozilla reports that over the last few years, the authorities have used more technologies to surveil communities like automated license plate readers, body-worn cameras, cell site simulators, drones, facial recognition, predictive policing, and uh, video analytics. Additionally, the state-sponsored pandemic responses for contact tracing seem to have been avenues for the state and the private sector to include more surveillance and censorship of individuals. And finally, consider the technologies of risk assessment tools like financial risk assessment, educational loans, medical risk, and family risk assessment. These are tools used by the corporations from both the government and the private sector to rate and rank individuals from the subordinated groups than those within the dominant groups. The technology, however, is neutral. It could as well have been used for the benefit of the masses or the marginalized people by redirecting it to examine the ways in which the institutional players, players cause harm uh, more harm to the public good. For example, we have instances where the judicial system is considering using AI as a technology for gauging the risk of recidivism in released convicts. Additionally, the citizen app is used to report instances of all crimes from the petty ones to the major ones to thus help people identify safe places to walk or jog within a city. Here, I represent a similar technology that's being directed in the opposite direction towards the institutional players. Uh, within the application called the New Inquiry. This is a map of Boulder, Colorado, which highlights possible areas of white collar crime risk zones. It would be interesting to note that, uh, or to determine the sort of data that is gathered and used by the service to make this prediction and to determine the reasons why it thinks that these, uh, these regions which have been highlighted in red are high risk zones. However, the important takeaway that we have is that technologies that we have can be repurposed to help guide institutional change rather than being targeted at individual persons. Similarly, there are projects which attempt to direct the use of AI, not at the convicts, but towards the judge judges. These systems can determine the extent to which a judge is biased or holds implicit bias and helps to identify ways in which we can train the judges to be less biased. With all those examples on different ways in which technologies may be used, against the masses or the institutional players, let's proceed to examine how technology is used as a tool for oppression. One of the most recent technological developments that has had a major role in shaping the political climate in US, India, and many countries around the world is the disinformation architecture that has been established, possibly with taxpayers' money. It is the anti-social technology that works to destroy the social fabric that constitutes a democratic society. It does so by ensuring that people are bucketed and siloed into information bubbles and echo chambers. Each person is possibly given their own fishbowl to inhabit while they assume that they are actually consuming the digital content that all of the digital content that's all out there without having passed through any filters. The biggest platforms do not disclose how they develop or train their recommendation algorithms. Further, the technological policy on forwarding and sharing of social messaging apps has led to a staggering scale, scale of the spread of misinformation. Additionally, the progress from misinformation uh, or the sharing of misinformation is not completely addressed by, com by merely deleting the content. People may have already downloaded the content and shared them over anonymous networks like Reddit or through their personal messaging platforms. So some of these early, further, some of the early practices of anti-social behavior that the world has witnessed since the start of the internet is doxing and cyberbullying. These continue to be concerns associated with the use of digital platforms as they are ways to intimidate, harass, suppress the voices of individuals thus isolating them and causing possible physical or psychological harm. Now, technology is not just uh, 
a tool for operation, it can be used as a tool for resistance and protection. Professor Zainab Tufekci in her book, The Twitter and Teogas helps us understand the ways in which network communication platforms are being used as instruments for the mobilization of people, of activists, of citizens for social and political causes. The other technologies that are being used are the Tor browser for private browsing, end-to-end -end encrypted messaging apps like Signal and Telegram. Uh, the UNI project started in 2012 helps citizens measure the level of network censorship that exists within their countries. Now to summarize, we need to realize that in the current age of surveillance capitalism, technology and society is very intimately connected. Government and private organizations are working towards creating a parallel universe with, where every non-living entity has a digital twin, where every person has a digital character and every interaction leaves a digital footprint in the digital infrastructure that overlays all human activity. The digital infrastructure that's established is what shall guide organizations as a frame of reference for determining people's livelihoods and their professional prospects. So the question to ask is, if there's an error that occurs in the digital infrastructure, who has the power and the voice in seeking to obtain rectification of these errors? Reflecting back on an earlier slide, we might currently be in a period where we are in the process of creating a new system of oppression, a caste-based system that is based on digital access and the notion of privacy and the safety of individuals of, of their digital character within the digital infrastructure. We as a society today face the responsibility of moving away from the advertised corporate speak and happy talk and take heed of the views of the marginalized groups to listen and understand their needs and the framing of the problems they face. We do know that the technologies of control are tested um, on the most vulnerable groups of people. We have seen that there's a lack of representation of individuals uh, from historically marginalized groups within education, healthcare, and technology. There's little change in diversity based on race and ethnicity in technology firms. And consequently, the lack of diversity in tech taints our perspective of AI and many other important tools that shape the digital infrastructure that increasingly governs our lives. So we need to address the silence that exists within the context that we inhabit, the professional and the private spaces. If you're informed about the system of oppression and you perceive that the institutions you work in are remaining silent, then there's a possibility that the institution is profiting and benefiting from this particular system of oppression. We need to realize that we are all in this together. As an individual, you might be thinking about the silence and reflecting on whether you actually have a say or a voice in this matter. As Rebecca Solnit says, there are three things that matter in having a voice, audibility, credibility, and consequence. If you have audibility, it means that you can be heard, that you have not been pressed into silence or kept out of the arenas in which you speak or write. If you have credibility, it refers to the fact that you can get into the arenas and people are willing to believe you for the stories and the narratives that you share with them on the context, um, on just the content that you share rather than your social status. And to be of consequence means that you're a person that matters. If you matter, you have rights and your words serve those rights and give you the power to bear witness, to make agreements and to set boundaries. Each one of us needs to examine the extent to which we truly have a voice and then use that voice to speak. The folks in STEM seem to be caught in this illusion of technological solutionism, a belief that we can find technological solutions to bypass human frailties and biases. We aspire to build AI machines that is just and equitable and fair to humans. But the challenge is that we humans haven't figured this out yet. We need to do the work first before we can guide a machine to do it for us. We need to ask ourselves if we truly believe that it's possible to find all the solutions to the systems of oppression within society through technology itself. What the last few years have shown is that technology has not only helped to accentuate the differences and, um, and to reproduce the systems of oppression that it was developed within. I would like to summarize this section with this quote by Professor Ruha Benjamin, indifference to social reality by technologists can be even more harmful than malicious intent. Now, these are some of the books that have helped to shape my thoughts and I'd like to study them more deeply. And with all that we have covered, we can take the next step to consider the future of the autonomous self. I would like to start this with a quote by Arindra Thiroy from her work, uh, Pandemic as a Porter. We need to realize that the uh, sorry. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. 
We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and the smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through it lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world. We need to realize that the context at which we need to start working is at the personal level, at the level of dreaming and imagining an alternative reality. An alternative reality that we would like our next generation to inherit from us. And that depends on asking ourselves these difficult questions. What do you value? What do you dream or imagine about the future of humanity? What does personal autonomy mean to you? How do you intend to protect personal autonomy as an individual and as a community? In what ways do you benefit from the systems of dominion that you find yourself in? So what we have seen is that um, we continue to exist in a world where the collective human imagination is fragmented, right? By the systems of oppression that exist today. It might be difficult for us to see each other as an equal if we do not dream or imagine a world that a world within ourselves where we see each other as equals. The Internet Health Report 2020 says that normalizing consumer tech surveillance is making people vulnerable to control, right? And this has serious consequences to society as it leads to the rise of autocratic governments across the globe and to a decline in the strength of the democratic institutions that have been established over the few, last few decades. So we have the responsibility to pause and to think, what kind of technology do we really want? What are the highest values of ours that we would like to embed inside our technology? And as we think about these questions, I'd like to share this quote by Audrey Lord. There is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And finally, I'd like to say that the future of the autonomous self depends on how we choose to address the past that we have inherited. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Prash. That was a great talk. <laughs> I, I certainly learned a lot. So I, I would encourage the audience to ask some more questions. Uh, in the meantime, I had a personal question for you. Yes. Um, uh, you can turn off the screen here. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so my question for you is, what do you believe is the most direct action an individual can take to preserve their autonomy? I think... Uh, the most direct step that they can take is to inform themselves, right? To understand what are the ways that they have been conditioned in as they have grown from a child and, you know, developed into an adult. Because there are many things that we learn from our families and we used to take them as, you know, as truth. And it is the more you educate yourself, the more aware you become. And the more aware you become, the, the higher the possibility that we can imagine others to be just like us. Mm. Yeah. Well noted. <laughs> All right. So we do have a question from Spotty Oreo 10. <laughs> Can you okay. explain surveillance capitalism? So the surveillance capitalism is, uh, so I would recommend you to read the book uh, by Soshana Zuboff. And there's a lot of videos on YouTube, but I could tell you that the way I understand it, this is a larger system or mm -hmm. it, it's basically a logic that drives all the political, um, the entities, the economics within the markets right now, and the social relationship that we all have. So in a sense, think of it this way. Why do we use Instagram and we keep posting stuff about ourselves, right? We are engaging in, an, in a behavior where we as a person, we are surveilling ourselves and sending off the data to private organizations. Private mm -hmm. organizations keep that data. The governments can request the organization for that information and use it for whatever purposes that they want, right? So in a sense, we are doing the espionage of ourselves for them. And that's kind of the, the, the meaning of surveillance. And capitalism comes from the point that every relationship that we have is being monetized, right? So that's kind of like the layman's explanation that I can give. Um, and it's true. I need to study this further too. But yeah, that's all I can say for now. It sounds like our own data is the most prized possession we have. Yeah, and, and I think that's safeguard that. Exactly, Jamie. And I think that's why they call data as the, the, the oil of the current age. <laughs> well noted. All right. We have an additional question from Pallavi. How does a lack of diversity affect AI? Can you share an example? Lack of diversity affect AI. So I think one of the examples that we've seen in the past was mm -hmm. when we talk about facial recognition systems, right? 
and um, mm. i think there's the work by the algorithmic justice league um, i believe wherein what they said was of this of the founder of the league when she was doing her research she noticed that her camera does not identify her face mm. so when she's there in a zoom meeting what in essentially the the face tracker does not track her and she had to wear a white a mask which was painted white wow. for for the camera to detect that this is a person who's there in front of it so yeah i think and the consequence of this is not that the, the device does not detect you mm-hmm. the the consequence is the impact on the person psychology am mm-hmm. i not person enough for this technology which has been pro- which has been marketed and sold by let's say apple or microsoft or any other big company to detect me as a person right mm-hmm. so is something wrong with me or is it something wrong with the machine and i think that internal conflict is what breaks a person or what causes harm mm-hmm. yeah and it's tough right because you can't really separate creator from creation and so there may be some some biases that get transferred into that technology if you don't have a diverse creation staff right <laughs> so yeah that's so one way to look at it is about diverse creation staff the other way is about diverse uh, data sets but there's mm-hmm. also something else wherein we think about we need to realize that systems that we encode code itself is policy or law mm-hmm. so the way i was saying the social norms impacts law and policy if you can start looking at the code and the software as a law or a policy mm-hmm. then the social norms get written into that in a way so I yeah see. awesome awesome all right we have an additional question for you so what do you say to people who are willing to give up their freedom for surveillance security what are the implications of that i think most of us when we do this when we give up our freedom for the notion of safety Mm-hmm. we assume that there is someone else who is benevolent who will not cause harm to us i think what we do not often think about is what if that person chooses to become malicious mm-hmm. right and we would like to believe and i think that comes from a child psychological development process wherein we always think oh my parents are going to help me out i need a parent figure who is going to protect me and it is with that intention we believe that there are systems that are always going to be there but i think what we all need to do is not focus on having someone out there to take care of us but to build our community and the diversity of our relationships so that each one of us can protect each other rather than relying on any human system that we build because human systems as we have seen the governments nation states businesses companies all human systems have the the frailties of any human being Mm. right they have greed they are driven by greed they are driven by power and control so yeah that's my thoughts on that interesting that's very interesting so i, I had a follow up question to that do you think we will reach a stage where the people can really take the technology into their own hands for now it seems that corporations and governments and these large entities are really the the managers of of this technology do you think that we can reach a point where the people have more power and say on the regulation and the input um I, yes yeah. i think it is not that um, it is not that we don't have a power right now it is just that people are not more informed like if you look at the computer science as a field it's a very young field mm-hmm. the internet just started 30 years or 40 years ago right mm-hmm. and the even the scale at which companies have grown the companies themselves don't know where they're going in a way like they are all trying to see so what i'm trying to say here is uh, there was a time when people were doing sharing on torrent of files and videos and all of that and then we had legislation that came about to protect people's content um uh, we just uh, so i think yeah i might my thoughts are just going all over but yeah. i do feel that uh we are in a place we just need to be more informed and careful about uh understanding what is happening in the technological realm and to mm-hmm. make sure that we have concerns and we voice our concerns Mm. and i think we will be in a situation where we can protect um, and ensure that people are the ones who drive the technology rather than the corporates themselves but it's mm. true cyberspace which was dreamt of as being the place where all humanity would be free that cyberspace has itself been cut into nation states within each corporation owned mm. by a corporation so i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> great insight you certainly chose a very loaded topic I, my sort of final question for you is 
throughout the creation of this talk, what was the most interesting piece of information or revelation that you stumbled upon? Was there something that you weren't expecting to discover when you were creating this talk? I think the whole talk was itself a discovery for me in a sense <laughs> because I didn't know, like given my background in engineering and every, and like I've been in the sciences and engineering, I, I didn't know how do I think about personal autonomy? Like where do I start? Mm -hmm. And it was a challenge in figuring out where to start. And I, I read a few books on cognitive science and psychology and everything like that. And then it's finally when I'm trying to create the presentation that I realized, oh, so this is how these things connect. Because it, and then in a sense, I think that I'm really glad I took part for, you know, making mm -hmm. this presentation. Because when we read stuff, we always get concepts and they're all in different places. It's when you try to create a linear flow that you synthesize everything really well. Um, so I think everything that I've got, even the presentation I've shared, that in itself is the the discovery for me. Awesome, awesome. And you know, for me, I'm just I'm thinking about technology becoming even more personable, even more integrated. So like smart watches, Google glasses. I feel like it's no longer me engaging with a separate entity, but it's 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 now encroaching upon my very essence, you know, yeah. so that's cyborg. Just, like if you're becoming cyborgs as, right. as, as such, yes. I think, um, have you read uh, Professor Yuval, um, Yuval Harari? I have not. Okay, so he, uh, like this, he's written a book called Sapiens. And after that, he's written a book where he starts thinking about homo deus, the future of man, mm -hmm. in which he talks about us becoming cyborgs. And his main point is that, yes, in the past, we had biotechnology and genetic manipulation. And now we have technology which gets integrated with our being. Mm -hmm. The concern here is, yes, there is risk. There is a lot of surveillance that can happen. Mm -hmm. The question is, are we informing ourselves enough about what we want to protect, what mm -hmm. we value about ourselves before we start adopting these technologies? Mm -hmm. And it's not only about adopting the technologies. It's also about writing and contributing to the legislation that governs the formation of technologies. Because mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, we don't want it to be the, like the way it happened for the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. The scientists built the bomb and like, oh man, now we're going to bomb everyone. It's going to, it's going to hurt a lot. <laughs> so you need to build up the legislative or the, the legal framework first before you build a technology which can cause all the damage, I guess. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So, well, we can talk for hours about this. Uh, before yes. we end, is there any final takeaway you'd like to say to the audience? I think it's about, uh, I think the last part, which I said, we really need to think about the past uh, if we want to figure out how we want to handle the future. And second is uh, know that you have a voice and you know use it to speak up. That's all. Great takeaway. Thank you so much uh, for your talk tonight, Prash. And as a reminder for everyone, uh, our next Sidome talk will be the craziest creatures on earth, what the world's wackiest or what the world's wackiest organisms can tell us about life in the cosmos. That will be given by Dr. Graham Lau on March 11th at 7 p.m. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thank you, Prash, again. Thank you, Jeremy, our navigator. We'll Thank see you everyone. next time. Good night.